Welcome and thank you all for joining us today. This week's webinar, What Does the Federal Budget Mean for Your Business? is with CFIB and we're happy to announce special guests with, with PayWorks. Um, the webinar will begin shortly. I'll just make a few technical notes before we begin. On the webinar panel, this is the blue or orange flower icon on your screen. You'll see the handouts pane. Here you can find today's presentation and you can open and save it following. There's also a questions pane where you can enter your questions for our panelists today, and we will try to answer as many questions either through the chat box direct to you or during our live Q&A session towards the end. Following the webinar, please take a moment to complete a short survey letting us know your experience today. We do take your feedback and um, try to incorporate that going forward. You'll also receive a recording of today's session by email tomorrow. And with that, that, I will now introduce Laura Jones, our Executive Vice President and Chief Strategic Officer. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Alexa, and welcome everyone to our 47th um, weekly webinar. And I am joined by my, as, as usual, I'm joined by my uh, very capable colleague, Corinne Pullman, who's going to run us through the federal budget. Uh, we have 700, I think it was 724 pages of the federal budget, so it's a big tome to digest. Um, but we've had a number of staff members combing through it and making sure that we understand what you need to know uh, from the federal budget. So um, we'll spend most of our time today on that and answering any questions you might have. Really Really, really grateful to PayWorks for helping us put this webinar on and we have a special guest from uh, PayWorks, Christine, who's going to join us in a few minutes as well and um, talk a little bit about some of the things that they have. PayWorks has uh, been a partner of CFIBs for over a decade, I think. Corinne? will correct me on that if I'm wrong, um, but a fantastic partner that we hear a lot of great things from members uh, about. We use them ourselves at CFIB and they've saved us um, a bunch of money on our on our payroll uh, processing. So um, we, we personally kind of endorse them based on our own uh, experience. Rachel's also with us today. So Rachel can help answer some of the questions and tell us what's coming through the helpline um, on the uh, for the webinars. Um, if we go to the next slide, just I like to put this commitment up there for those of you who've been joining us from the beginning. I know you probably uh, you've seen this slide before, but it has our phone number at the bottom there and our website and just our commitment to keep this website um, up to date with new information as it comes in. And it's been a little bit like drinking from a fire hose for, for the last year for all of you. We know in terms of the various government support programs. And so we're trying to make that um, as, as easy and straightforward as, as we can and support you getting the information you need through these webinars, but also through our website. So that's a great place to go um, if you're looking for information. And on the next slide, um, we always like to start these webinars with a few, few quotes. My, my favorite from today is, uh, don't worry about the world coming to an end. It's already tomorrow in Australia. So just a little funny humor there, um, but some good ones on, on courage too. And we've talked about that many times uh, through the pandemic and um, the importance of maybe leaning on, on uh, wisdom from, from others um, in tough times. We all have our favorite quotes, I think, that we carry around uh, with us that we sort of remember when things are are difficult and um, Corinne was telling me hers earlier actually maybe she'll share it um, when she comes on the screen because she was telling me that yesterday and I think it's a really good one um, so the um, next slide is what we're going to uh, cover today. And as I said, the overview of the federal budget, um, we had six big things we were asking for. The two biggest ones were no new costs or taxes for small business and an extension um, and expansion of pandemic uh, support. And so our batting average on the six is not too bad. They come from you. What you wanted us to ask for in the budget through our, our weekly surveys, I'll remind you of that. So um, some good news coming out of the budget. Um, you know, it's never, it now they they haven't done everything we wanted and there's always more work to do um, but there is some good news so Corinne's going to share um, some of what happens happened in the budget but we both want to really emphasize and you'll hear us both say this a couple of times throughout the webinar stuff that comes out in a budget document hasn't yet gone through the legislative process so it's not as if they announce it and the application is is open so there's always a delay and i know that's really frustrated and frustrating and we've seen that throughout the pandemic they'll make an announcement about a new program and then you know the applications won't be open for weeks in some cases months 
um, after the announcement. So that's the same with some of the things we've heard in the budget. So we'll be really clear um, about that as we go through the program. So what we're going to be sharing with you today is the high level direction that government's going. And of course, through the webinars, we'll keep you and our website, we'll keep you up to date when applications are open and when things um, are available to, to, uh, uh, for you to actually, you know, get. Um, and then we're going to hear from PayWorks and as always your questions. And so with that, if we go to the next slide, um, we're, um, this is one Corinne found. And again, many of you expressed last time that you like it when we inject a little bit of humor. And so when we come across things that make us smile, like this uh, cartoon, we um, share them, uh, uh, share them with you. And um, so hopefully this picture is one that's going to be changing uh, soon. Okay. Um, Next slide, um, Corinne, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to join and I'm gonna disappear and let you take it away because there's lots of great uh, news to share, but also some new restrictions that we wanna run people through and just some general information. And um, maybe I'll stay up for this slide and then I'll leave you to do the federal yeah. stuff. I think that sounds like a plan. Um, hello everybody and uh, thanks for rejoining us again or joining us for the first time, wherever you, uh, whatever it may be. Um, before we jump into the budget, there were a couple small things we just wanted to continue to sort of talk about. You know, the third wave has brought even more new restrictions. Our last um, webinar for those that were there, but even if you missed it, was uh, basically an overview from all our provincial colleagues on some of the provincial restrictions as well as programs that existed. It was a really good one. But even since then, two weeks ago, we've seen even more new restrictions implemented in various jurisdictions across the country. So. Unfortunately, things have not been going in the uh, positive direction at this point. The positives, though, is that the vaccines do continue to roll out. More and more people are getting vaccinated um, at younger ages so and more broadly. So hopefully, at some point, those two things will sort of even out and one will start taking over. And so that's, of course, I think what we're all hoping for. Um, the other sort of more technical pieces are, first, the... Um, as you may recall, all of the SIRS, the rent subsidy program and wage subsidy programs, um, they, they are, you apply by period and you have until 180 days after those periods uh, to apply for them. So as of today, we started like today, you can know this is the last day you can still apply for period one of the rent subsidy or period eight of the wage subsidy, which was the period from September 27th to October 24th. So those are, uh, if you haven't applied, today is the last day you can do it for those periods. So I encourage you to, to do that. Before I get to the provincial ones, I wanted to bring Rachel up because Rachel came to our uh, webinar today with some late breaking news that may help some of you um, in regards to folks that may want to do an adjustment to their wage or rent subsidy uh, application. So Rachel, over to you to give that update. Yeah, so businesses have 30 days from the later of either April 21st, 2021, or from the applicable filing deadline, so that 100, so that 180 days um, after. Um, so yeah, they, they have that to to uh, receive a greater SUSE SERS if they made a mistake, and that's what CRA is kind of they're calling an upward adjustment. Um, there's also an added um, news that those who are not able to apply for SERS or SUS um, in certain circumstances, like the CRA portals were locked um, or, or CRA gave them the wrong information um, or delayed their application unintentionally, um, you can actually call uh, the CRA Business Inquiries line to determine um, if, if you can get a late application in. Uh, to CRA. So definitely recommend that people take advantage of those 30 days uh, to submit those late applications or um, up, upward adjustments if possible. And Rachel, yeah. for people who might be in that situation, do they, do you, are you just recommending they call CRA or is there something else they should do? Yeah, that's that's the best uh, course of action. If you have any written documentation, um, if you remember that agent ID number, um, go into your notebook, that journal, uh, make sure you have it on hand when you call that CRA business inquiries line and be ready for these long waits because you're not the only ones who are hearing about this. Um, so yeah, buckle up for that. that. But that's still the best way to do it, to make the call. And maybe we can put that number in the chat just to remind people, I'm sure we've put it up on previous webinars, but 
um, just to remind people, and it might be a number to jot down in, in the journal Rachel's referring to. For any of you who are new, as we keep making this recommendation, just keep a, a business journal to sort of keep track of this, all this fire hose of information that's coming at you and what you might um, forget to remember later that, that, that you need to know. So thank you for that. And Corinne, just yeah. back to the, uh, mm -hmm. to the vaccines and what we're hearing about the third wave. Some of the health um, officials we've been talking to, we're, in, we're plugged into um, groups that meet with the provincial um, health officials, for example, in BC, I'm um, plugged into the group that meets with Bonnie Henry. And, you know, what we are hearing is they are, they're, they're, they're hoping, I mean, they're cautiously optimistic that after the May long weekend, that's when enough Canadians will be vaccinated that we'll really start to see a number and, a, 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 you know, a change in the numbers. So just to give people that um, intel that we have. And one more thing before you get onto the grant programs, Corinne, I just said that you shared your favorite um, saying that you lean on with me yesterday. Maybe you could share that with the group. <laughs> Laura's telling all my secrets. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so one of the things we were talking yesterday about sort of quotes that have meaning in your life or that uh, certainly drive you and the quote that uh, has driven me most of my life is basically um, regret the things you do, not the things you don't do. So that's something that's always made me think about uh, what it is that life takes you. And when you have sort of crossroads in your life, it's some of the things that's always guided me. So there you go. That's mine. <laughs> okay, back to our regularly right. scheduled Back program. to the regularly scheduled the program. So the only other thing we want to mention before we jump into the budget is the fact that a couple of provinces did announce new grant programs for small businesses. Unfortunately, it was because both of those provinces also went into further restrictions. Um, but uh, Alberta has gone to a third round of their SME relaunch grant. And so that is going to allow folks to get an additional up to $10,000 until May 31st. Um, they got rid of another grant that they had sort of brought up instead and, and just replaced it with one that has already been working well and, and gone to a third round of that one. BC announced uh, something called a Circuit Breaker Business Relief Grant, um, and they're going to have grants of, of $1,000 to $10,000, and those applications are open until June 4th. So there are some links there for you to sort of go and look at them if you were from one of those two provinces and are interested in those programs. The other thing that Corinne, you and I have been talking about is um, based on the popularity of the webinar that we did a couple weeks ago where we were looking at all of the provinces um, that we might do more uh, regional ones. So do one for our Ontario members, one for our Atlantic members and one for our Western members to do a little bit of a deeper dive on the programs that are available um, and what's going on at the provincial level. So let us know either in the um, follow up little questionnaire you get or in the in the chat whether that would be something that you would find useful and we'll because we're always looking at what you know how to how to get you the information you need and yeah, with that, and, yeah and let us know what region you're from so we can have a sense of whether it's you know there's enough sort of interest in various regions to do it so yeah perfect and with that Corinne the, the federal budget congratulations you got a lot of what you were looking for I know not everything but no. um, We'll see if IB team has been working really hard on some of this. So you're going to run through what it means for our participants and what we're still asking for. And I'll be back Correct. later. Great. Yeah, I will. Um, and so jumping right in, we're going to start with the good news. Um, first, uh, of course, the good news around the wage subsidy and the rent subsidy is that they have been extended from June 5th, which was the originally time it was going to end to September 25th. And they're going to make provisions to perhaps have it even go into November, up to November 20th if necessary. So it really is going to depend on how things roll out over the course of the next six months. I'm sorry if the charts are a bit small here, but you do have the handout in the attachment on the side that you can pull up and take a look at it a little bit more closely. Um, but the one change that they've made is that for the June to July period, so the one that's, that's going to be exactly the same as it is up until June, nothing is going to change. But starting on the July period, um, they are now going to require you to have at least a 10% revenue drop in order to apply. It used to be you could have just as long as you had any revenue drop, you could apply. They are going to increase that threshold to 10% starting in July. Um, and, and then they are going to start reducing the rates as of July. And that's what those charts are there to tell you how that's going to work. One caveat, though, is that lockdown support that's associated with the rent subsidy, that's the 25% extra that you can get on the rent subsidy if you're completely shut down um, or a significant portion of your business is completely shut down, that will remain right up until September 25th as well. 
So the charts are basically just going to try to, I mean, hopefully they make some sense, but they are trying to just give you a sense of how the rates are going to change based on the amount of your revenue decline. Um, we'll just sort of look at the 70% plus, which is the highest level of revenue decline. Um, and you can see there at the top level how that top level of subsidy starts to go down after July. So in July, it's still 75% for the wage subsidy, 65% for the rent subsidy. But then starting in July, it starts to go down from there. So 60% for both the rent and wage subsidy. August, it goes down to 40 and then September down to uh, 20. With the idea that it will eventually um, wind up at that point. However, if things change or we're not out of this yet, there is that provision, as I said, Said that they will prolong it and I suspect make changes to the actual amounts of the subsidy as we get closer to those dates if needed. So that's the first piece of good news. The second slide, the next slide touches on a new program that we were very pleased to see, something we've been advocating for. It's called the Canada Recovery Hiring Program and it is brand new and just to be clear it's not open for applications yet. It will open uh, as of June um, what it does is it's going to provide a subsidy of up to 50% to offset the costs, the extra costs that you've taken on as you reopen. This is because you've either increased the wages or hours worked or you've hired more staff between June 6th and November 20th, which is when the program is going to be in place, compared to what you had in your staff uh, between March 14th to April 10th, which is called the baseline period. So you'll notice some of the language very similar to the wage subsidy. Um, so it is going to be sort of similar in that regard. So the baseline period is whatever your staff was, complement was from March 14th to April 10th, 2021. Anything you have above that starting in June, you can get up to 50% um, of that incremental cost back in the form of a subsidy. Now, as you can see, because it starts in June and the wage subsidy still exists in June, you, you will have both programs available to you at that point in time. So you actually can choose which program to use. You can't use both though. You have to use one or the other, but you can use the one that's best, that will give you the most bang for your, um, I guess bang for your buck or the highest uh, level of subsidy that exists. Um, there is some eligibility criteria. For example, it's only applicable um, to CCPCs, that's Canadian Controlled Private Corporations, uh, which is of course almost every small company in Canada is a CCPC and you have to have your payroll account open with CRA on March 15, 2020. So the bad news is if you're a new business it's not applicable to you. Something that we're very concerned about I'm going to talk about that again in a minute. Um, if you've already gotten the wage subsidy or you've been eligible for the wage subsidy but you haven't gotten it for whatever reasons then you should generally be able to get this particular uh, subsidy as well. Um, so, as I said, it applies to the baseline period. Um, the maximum amount of uh, remuneration that it will apply to per employee is $1,129 per week, similar again to the wage subsidy, I think. Um, and in order to access it, you have to have a revenue loss of more than zero uh, percent. So it has to have, you can have any kind of revenue loss for the first month, for that's that June 4th to July uh, 3rd period. After that, though, you have to have at least a 10% revenue drop in order to be able to apply from July through to November. It does have a bit of a sliding scale, too. It comes in, it starts at 50% for the first three months. Starting in August, though, it'll go down to 40, and then down to 30, and then down to 20 by the time it ends in November. So that is the plan right now for that program. We are going to wait still more details as we get it. It does not start until June. Uh, so June 4th, so we'll have a bit of time and as we get more information and have the information available, it, we will certainly be sharing it with you. It will be administered by the CRA, so uh, much like the wage subsidy is. All right, move to the next slide. <clears throat> the other piece of good news um, was the budget did talk about doing some work to reduce credit card transaction fees. So for those of you who accept credit cards, I know many of you have had to sort of pivot to accepting payments online or accepting payments over the phone. Um, and that has probably increased your cost of accepting credit cards because those transactions tend to be higher. We've been advocating strongly for government to do something to address this. We were focused a bit more on not having, um, not requiring merchants to charge, uh, to, sorry, let me start that again. Not requiring merchants to actually have to, to pay a um, credit card fee on top of the GST, for example. 
Um, but the government has, isn't necessarily going to address that. But what they are going to do is they are going to say they're going to work with key stakeholders, of which CFIB has already been identified as one of the key stakeholders, to find a way to lower the average overall cost of interchange fees for merchants and to make sure that small businesses benefit from pricing that is usually um, available only to larger businesses. So those are a couple of really good outcomes from there. Not a lot of other news around it, though, but they do say, say that next decks will be outlined in the economic statement, which is generally in sort of the November period uh, of every year. The last piece of good news, there is a few other sort of pick pockets of it, but the last one I, I wanted to just share today is that they have introduced something called immediate expensing. What this is, and it's going to allow temporarily up until the end of 2023, you can immediately expense what they call eligible property, as long as, again, you're a Canadian controlled private corporation. Um, going from this day forward, basically, until the end of uh, 2023, up to $1.5 million of any capital expense that you may want to acquire. Um, now that's per year, so you can do it in 21, 22, and 23, up to 1.5 million. Um, now, if you're a part of a group or an associated member, you have to use, share it with everybody. If you don't use a full amount in a given year, you can't carry it over, but you do have 1.5 million to expense in your purchase. The only types of properties or, or capital that's not included is anything that has what they call a long-term asset, which is generally real estate. So if you're buying a, a property or a piece of land, that may not necessarily be associated with this. But if it's machinery and equipment, if it's technology, if it's investments or renovations in your business that you would normally have to sort of uh, pay out over a number of years, you can expense it now in the year of purchase, which may help a little bit in terms of your bottom line. So that was another piece of interesting news that came out of the budget. All right, on to uh, the less good news, um, some of the bad news. So unfortunately, there were no fixes of the gaps in the emergency relief programs, many of which we've talked about on these webinars over the last several months. Um, for example, there's still no access for new businesses that open their doors after March 1st, 2020. This is a huge gap for us. Um, so we are continuing to sort of raise this, uh, the alarm bells around doing something for these folks. There is going to be more money um, to what they call the regional development agencies, and they claim that some of those programs should be made more available to newer businesses, but we know that that itself has also had a bit of its own challenges for many businesses who went through the regional development agencies, so we'll continue to sort of advocate on their behalf. Yeah, I just wanted to pause on that point, uh, Corinne. Stephen was um, making the uh, point that, you know, why do new businesses continue to be ignored? Can someone explain the rationale for this? And, you know, there's obviously no common sense rationale for this, but I know one of the things that we hear frequently for gov from government, and I think this is a bigger obstacle than many imagine, is the programming and the technical side of this and how they would, you know, retroactively fit newer businesses which don't have the same kind of criteria as older businesses in. It's not an excuse. We're not making excuses for government, but Stephen was just asking, you know, about the rationale and why it's so challenging. And I think that's a big part of what, why, and, but you might want to add to that. Yeah, and I think it's also, they, they don't quite know what their baseline should be, um, because obviously for all the older businesses, it's compared to what they earned a year ago. So it's relative to what they were able, what their normal sort of sales are. And because new businesses obviously don't have a baseline, they're struggling with figuring out how to do that. However, we keep pointing out to them, we've given them some suggestions, for, for example, what is the average you know, revenues of that type of business in that community usually as one baseline or two, you know, it could be based on whatever the, you know, we're now a year in, if they opened in March or April of last year, now you, can, you could probably do some work on trying to work through what were their higher levels, what were their lower levels. And thirdly, a, lot, you know, a few provinces have created grant programs that have included new businesses. So they have figured out a way to still provide some sort of assistance. So we don't really you know, buy that excuse, but it is one that, uh, that you pointed out, Laura, that has been some of the feedback we've gotten from government. They tell us, because we, we raised it yet again after the budget, um, that they're still working on it, that they're still trying to find a solution, but that it's been very challenging. So I don't know, we're, we're just going to keep pushing and asking for something. I just don't understand why it's been such a huge issue. 
And you're quite right. We've had more success with it in some cases at the provincial level. So BC's new circuit breaker grant is a good example of that. It includes the um, newer businesses. One other uh, quick uh, couple of comments that I'll throw in, Corinne, while you're um, going through this is um, Joe is making the point that everything the government gives employers and employees needs to need, needs to come with a caveat. It's all taxable, and a lot of taxpayers are finding out this now as they're kind of filing their taxes that businesses, you know, um, and and basically reminding people that this stuff is taxable. And so I thought that was a good point. And then um, right after that, I got a question from Joanne um, kind of on that point. Do you have to claim the amount you receive for services income and pay income tax on it? So um, I just thought I'd throw that in there. Yeah, subsidies are all considered income. So you are expected to pay taxes on them. So that is the downside to them. So it's not completely free money, um, that's for sure. Um, yeah. But don't go away yet, though, because the next thing uh, we wanted to talk about is the fact that uh, the rent subsidy was one that had we felt that required a number of fixes, but they were not addressed either in this uh, particular budget. So maybe you want to touch quickly on that. Yeah, thanks, Corinne. So um, uh, the rent subsidy, especially those, we've heard a lot from businesses who have that uh, structure where you've got a holding company and an operating company and the, the non-arm's length um, uh, getting in the way of you getting the help that you need. And so based on a recommendation from a request and actually that came out of one of these webinars, we put together a very targeted um, petition on this issue and what we need is your stories of how that's affecting your your business and i know many of you have told us those stories and we've been sharing them um, with but this gives us a way to collect them all in one place and really get your voice directly to the politicians so our petition there's a little link there to the petition and we're uh, we'll be doing one of these for new businesses as well corinne i know we have a general petition and a petition page on our website um, that is for all the fixes but we're starting to be a little bit more targeted because the challenge with some of these smaller um, issues is they're not affecting hundreds of thousands of businesses they're affecting a lot of businesses in a big way but it's a smaller number and so we need to really keep hammering it otherwise they're saying well we're not hearing about that so um, uh, so if you can help us with that, if you're in that situation, please uh, fill that in. And we're using those in our ongoing lobbying on that. We haven't forgotten any of these other small issues. There's just so much to update you on that we're working on away on a whole bunch of different fronts. And this is one of them. Thanks. Yeah. For yeah, and the other is around the CBO loans, so the Canada Emergency Business Account loans. Um, as we did say in previous ones, the deadline has been extended to June. However, uh, there are quite a number of you still waiting to hear about how you can rectify um, your application to get the SEBA extension loan, which is the 20,000 extra. And we still heard nothing on when that's gonna happen. So those delays continue. So we're hopeful that now that the federal budget is done, that maybe more attention will be focused on this because one, one of the excuses we heard was that um, they needed finance to be online with this and they were busy with the budgets so when it ended up being installed. So hopefully that excuse will go away and we'll have some movement for those waiting for that SEBA extension loan. Um, there's also, of course, lots of shortcomings still to the non-deferrable expense stream for those of you that don't um, aren't eligible for the regular payroll stream, and they didn't address any of those either in this particular budget. So that's um, that's been a problem. Next is uh, no help with the debt burden. We have been doing research in this area and know that many of you have taken on uh, quite a bit of debt over the course of the pandemic. Um, our some of our numbers show as much as 170,000 new debt on average, which is just an incredible amount. So we've been pushing strong for government to help um, deal with that debt burden. I mean, we, nobody asked to take on this kind of debt. You were forced to do so uh, because of uh, circumstances outside of your control. Uh, however, none of our recommendations so far um, have made it into the budget itself. We were hoping they'd either increase SEBA, expand the forgivable loan, add, add a forgivable portion to HASCAP, all of those things, but none of those happened at this point. So our work on that one continues. And finally, as I'm sure you've heard in the media and elsewhere, this was a very large spending budget. Um, so those types of spendings, as I think was pointed out by one of your listeners already, could potentially turn into tomorrow's taxes. So we're watching out for some of those things as well. Um, there was a dramatic increase in spending on non-COVID related items. It's one thing if it's COVID related because eventually those will go away and we'll sort of um, not have to worry about those, but things that become part of the permanent uh, structure going forward, um, those are the ones we need to worry about. Um, 
There also was no change. There's already plans to increase liquor, carbon taxes, and CPP premiums. There was no chance, no change of plans to those increases that we know are still going to be coming uh, over the course of the next year. And we are a little worried about a new a new tax. Uh, one, there was a few new taxes uh, introduced. One of them that we're a little more worried about is the luxury tax, which will be imposed on more expensive cars, boats, and aircraft. Not so much because of that piece of it, but because we have many members of industries, especially, for example, in the boating industry that run marinas and other types of industries or, or retailers or services that service those types of um, vehicles that are worried that this will have an impact on their ability to uh, also receive revenues because it may um, derail folks from buying those particular uh, higher priced items. So we're watching that closely as well and uh, we'll certainly raise that concern. We go to the next slide, a couple more quick slides, just less on bad news and more just some other interesting things that we thought we may want to know about because they could affect you. For example, there was an announcement of about a $1 billion in tourism support. Uh, including 500 million that's going to go into a tourism relief fund that'll be administered by the regional development agencies. Again, not a lot more details, but um, once we have more details, we'll certainly share that with you to directly help the tourism industry. The other 500 million was sort of divided up between festivals and community events and all of those other types of uh, businesses that are have been affected because they haven't been able to operate either. There is going to be money going into those as well. There was this whole slew of hiring and training programs. Um, again, not a lot of detail in any of them, but you'll see there a list of some of them. Uh, there's the Canada Summer Jobs Program got more money. There's apprenticeship service that they want to create that could result in actually providing employers who bring on first year apprentices with a subsidy of $5,000 to help offset some of the costs. And if they're in a um, underrepresented group, that particular apprentice, you can get up to $10,000 to help offset those costs. So that's something to watch for. Uh, for those of you that do in, um, co-op placements or internships, there's more money going into that as well to try to encourage more hiring of young people. And there's also something coming called the Sectoral Workforce Solutions Program, which is actually meant to deliver more training that's relevant to small businesses. Very little detail. We're going to be working closely with government to figure out what does that look like and what is happening there. Um, the other things, uh, small things, um, if, uh, there are businesses, of course, that have to rely on temporary foreign workers, uh, especially in the agricultural industry at this time of year. There was some money that was had was running out, uh, I think I mentioned in our last webin our webinar, uh, to help them pay for mandatory quarantine for those temporary foreign workers. That particular program has been extended now until uh, June and will even be extended to August, but at a lesser amount. And finally, there was also something called the Canada Digital Adoption Program, um, and it's meant to help businesses that are moving more digital as a result of the pandemic, mm -hmm. to provide them support, advice, and even potentially some funding. Uh, again, not much more detail than that right now, and so those will definitely be things we'll share more with you once we understand better what it is and how they're going to work. The last slide I'm going to share with you uh, before we turn it over to our guest is the other budget announcements that we're watching closely. Um, you know, it's these are things that could potentially uh, have some cost implications for you and for um, as well, or other types of implications. Uh, for example, um, you know, you'll, I won't go through the whole list, but you can see there, uh, there's AI yeah, sickness benefits are slated to increase from 15 weeks to 26 weeks, effective summer of 2022. They talked about a federal minimum wage coming into play, though that again would only be for federally regulated companies. It wouldn't affect you if you're provincially regulated, but obviously can have an impact in terms of where the direction provinces may go in the future. Um, child care was a big focus of the budget as well. And what is that ultimately going to mean at the end of the day in terms of costs? Um, but potentially maybe it could be helpful for businesses that rely a lot um, on people that have children and need that care. So these are some of the things we're watching for. There were a sl slew of new taxes as well. Uh, the most significant I will uh, um, that will have more of an impact on you as a business owner is those that may sell tobacco or vaping products. There is uh, an increase in tobacco taxes as well as an introduction of an excise tax framework on vaping. So those are some of the things to watch for as well. So that's essentially an overview of the budget. Um, it is a very high level overview. It was a big tome. It was over 700 pages long. We are still waiting for details of many of these initiatives. There are things we haven't even talked about here. 
Um, if there are specific areas you're inter interested in us talking about in more detail in the future, please let us know. We're happy to do sort of a bit more deeper dive once we get more information into some of the things that you're maybe interested in hearing a bit more about. You're always welcome to call our helpline as well if you want to get more information. Finally, I will say and reiterate that many of these initiatives do require legislative approval. And so that has not yet happened. It still has to be uh, introduced into the House and go through the normal sort of procedures of the House to become actual legislation in order for them to be implemented. So those are some of the things still to come. So some of this still still may still take some time to be um, to be implemented in, in the future. So what I'd like to do now um, is introduce our guest, um, Christine from PayWorks. PayWorks, as Laura mentioned, has uh, been an awesome partner of ours for almost 10 years. It was not quite 10 years. We determined, Laura, and you said over, and I, it's just about uh, just under 10 years. PayWorks uh, obviously provides payroll solutions, but does more than that. They also have are a great way for a lot of small businesses to reduce their own uh, administrative burden. They take some of that away from you. Um, and we'll let Christine talk a little bit about that. But before I sort of turn it over to Christine for a couple of slides, I wanted to also uh, say if you're if you are looking for a payroll solution, you should really check it out. Our our exclusive discount with PayWorks is about 40%. It's a really good program. It's like we always hear about the excellent customer service they provide and uh, the discounts are significant. So I uh, encourage you to check it out if you have a moment. But Christine, over to you to uh, take us through a few more slides. Thank you, Corinne, and thanks everyone for having us here today. Um, definitely appreciate all your kind words. Um, so my name is Christine. Like Corinne mentioned, I am with the PayWorks Ontario team um, here today to talk to you a little bit about how PayWorks can help um, small businesses especially through the times that, that are in front of us today, um, both to help you keep compliant and to help streamline a lot of your processes as well. Um, we are a Canadian owned and operated uh, payroll and workforce management company, uh, really specializing in supporting Canadian small business. Uh, we've been in business since 2001. This year has definitely proved to be one of the most unique and challenging years um, that we've had in front of us. When the pandemic um, changed the way businesses businesses were operating back in March, we pivoted and adapted, uh, like most other businesses, like many of you had to, um, to really try and navigate the changing landscape that COVID presented to us, understanding the relief programs um, that were announced, which while they were much needed, um, they also caused us to have to stay on top of those and understand what that meant for all of the business owners across Canada. So we took to monitoring that um, alongside those um, changing tax programs and HR related initiatives, which we know takes a ton of time for business owners like yourself. Um, and we know that time is a hot commodity these days. So really focusing on um, making navigating those and the requirements as easy as possible. Uh, we know that announcements from the federal government um, in the most recent budget, budget like the extension to the, the wage subsidy program and the hiring programs will continue to impact the way that you do business today. Uh, where the paywork solution can really help with that um, is helping with reporting obligations for the wage subsidy program. And as we start to rebuild the economy and start opening back businesses back up, um, really helping you to efficiently onboard new employees, rehire employees that haven't been on payroll for some time, um, and really make that process as simple and seamless uh, for business owners and those that are tasked with doing that. If we could go to the next slide, please. Through all of this, PayWorks will continue to provide personalized service. Um, one of the key service offerings with PayWorks is every client has a dedicated customer service representative. Um, so you have someone there to support you with any questions that you might have. Um, continue providing legislative resources and unparalleled support throughout the pandemic um, and in the months and years that will follow as we continue to rebuild across Canada. Any good payroll solution will definitely help to flag rates that need to be adjusted as pay rates and tax rates change um, for your business um, all across Canada, so in every jurisdiction. Um, also relieving some of that um, administrative burden with doing things like your submission of taxes to the CRA and Revenue Quebec. We know with everything that you have on your plate today, um, taking some of those little things off of your plate can definitely help to allow you to focus on other areas of your business. Um, when the pandemic began, we did release and have constantly worked to keep it up to date and available to 
um, all of our clients and business owners across Canada, we released a COVID-19 government release and legislation guide. Um, so CFIB provides fantastic resources for all of you. Um, this can definitely help to supplement that. And I would definitely encourage any of you that are interested in taking a look um, to visit our website. Um, it's, the website is there where you can download the most recent version and sign up to keep um, updated with any changes along the way. Maybe we'll just leave that up for a quick second if anybody wants to write that down. And then if we can go to the next slide. So to wrap up my brief chat today, um, we're happy to provide um, a wellness package draw uh, for all of you that are in attendance today. We definitely recognize the need to find moments of uh, peace and time to relax during all of these times. Um, and really wanted to reward some of you with a, a small token uh, to help you in doing that. So um, we will work with CFIB um, to get the packages shipped out to you in the coming weeks, but I'd like to recognize our winners for this today's session. We have Ken Mattress, Andrea Hilton, Trish Pittman, Sharon Sampson, Conrad, Conrad LaFergie, Jocelyn Lowther, Johnny Rondellas, and Liz Lisa Menchion. So congratulations to all of you. Uh, like I said, we'll work to get those prize packages out to you in the coming week. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. And at this point, I'll turn it back over to Corinne and the team at CFIB uh, for the Q&A. Well, thank you so much, so much, Christine. I just want to say that um, some comments coming in from members. So uh, Alan says, uh, PayWorks is amazing, as you said, been with them for a number of years. Um, CFIB pricing is great. And um, Christine, as you know, um, we were so excited to become partners with PayWorks um, back almost 10 years ago uh, now and um, to support a, a, a mid-size uh, business in Canada uh, based in in Winnipeg and, um, and uh, you've been great uh, to work with for us personally for CFIB's payroll but also we get a lot of comments like that from members so thanks for everything you do and we also have been reinforcing on these webinars the importance of looking after yourself so thanks for helping with that uh, with the wellness packages it, it is uh, really critical at, at these challenging times. So, Corinne, I've got a number of questions and um, for for you <laughs> on the budget. So uh, maybe we'll get to some questions, and if there are any PayWorks questions, we can also take those. So feel free to um, chime in on those. Um, one uh, question is um, from Ugo is around the budget did not address extending the tax filing deadlines for businesses and individuals. So any news um, as to possible extensions? So yes, in those 724 pages, we didn't hear about that. <laughs> No, no, and we it's something we've been asking for as well. We had sent letters as early as uh, February <laughs> asking government to look at postponing um, the deadlines for um, tax remittances uh, for at least until June, whether corporate or personal, and GST for that matter. Um, we figured GST would be a long shot. They're less sort of keen on the GST side, but we thought maybe on the corporate and personal side, but given the timing now, we're basically, what, 10, not even 10 days away from the personal income tax deadline, it's unlikely it's gonna be extended. What they are doing though, um, the same with corporate taxes, we've heard zero. But the one thing on the personal income tax side is there was a small sort of caveat in some correspondence we got from CRA recently that said that for anyone who makes, who um, on the personal income tax side, who makes less than a certain amount, it was around the 75, 70,000, 75, thousand dollar mark and had to use one of the uh, emergency relief programs there was going to be flexibility as, as to the when you would have to pay so they weren't going to um, penalize you if you were in that category and you couldn't pay your taxes by April 30th so but for everybody else if you're in that boat if you're somebody who um, has to pay some taxes that are coming due whether it's corporate or personal and you don't have the cash right now to do it or the ability to do that right now, our strong recommendation is you call CRA and you talk to them about it. They are trying to be more lenient. Um, so if you do that, I think in advance and try to work something out with them, I don't know if you'll get away without any penalties and interest. 
but it's worth a try. Um, and so, I, you know, and you tell them your circumstances, they, they may very well give you a little bit more time or a little bit more flexibility around that. So that would be my recommendation. Yeah, it's almost always better to keep an open line of communication with them. I mean, there are some, maybe some exceptions to that. So I'll say almost always, but um, when, when CRA gets really nervous is when they, when you owe the money and they don't know where you are, they haven't heard from you or they can't get a hold of you. Um, there's one that is kind of in a similar vein here from Adam, which is, has there been any discussion with the government about extending the repayment of CERB, um, considering how much longer the lockdown has lasted? I have not. Uh, I might ask Rachel if she's heard anything. Um, CERB, um, we haven't had much new on CERB, I think, since the last fall when they, they said that the uh, repayments could be, um, I think, uh, they, they made some changes to the repayments at that time, but nothing since, I don't think, Rachel. Yeah, yeah, if you recall, there was this big issue between the net income and, and gross yes. income, and those who had used net income, because it wasn't clear, um, government put out a statement that that uh, they would not have to repay that money back. Um, but we still haven't heard any news on that yet. And we've asked as far as, as, as lately, as recently as last week, or this week actually, um, for updates on that. And CRA is still um, telling us to hold off. And yeah. Sorry about that. So we don't, unfortunately. You know, there's a number of comments and questions, Corinne, here, and not surprisingly about the um, lowering of, um, you know, the SUS and SERS reducing their the, the formula, and um, what happens if restrictions are still in place or things are still being, and I know that in your lobbying, um, you know, we, we, we were looking at two things. One big thing in the budget was getting these programs extended. And then the second thing we always look at is, is the formula reason, like is the formula high enough? And you, lo you know, we lobby on both of those things. How long should the restrictions be in place, which we've said as long, uh, sorry, the support be in place, which we've said is as long as the restrictions, but also the formula. Do you want to talk about how you lobby on the, the formula? And I guess the second part of this is both from Pat, Sheila, um, are asking, so that's kind of David's question in a nutshell, but Pat and Sheila are also asking about the travel um, travel uh, industry and, you know, real frustration on the travel industry side. I can talk in a minute about some of the research we're going to do on that, but um, maybe you want to do some of that. Yeah, so our um, advocacy is centered around uh, basically the premise that you just talked about, which is those emergency relief programs need to remain in place in some form, um, at least until every businesses can fully reopen and fully be able to bring back customers like they could prior to the pandemic. And that includes the border reopening as well, right? Because we know so many in the tourism sector rely on that border being open. Um, the other thing we've talked about is the fact that, you know, the other sort of, I guess, parameter that we need to use is governments have to stop telling people to stay home, right? Um, as long as governments are telling people to stay home, even if you allow businesses to reopen in some form, people aren't going to come to the same degree, right? So it's, um, and so because governments, you know, that's essentially they're trying to follow the rules. So those are all things we're watching for um, as we sort of do our advocacy work. If those things start to shift or change, then potentially we can look at how we start to um, reduce uh, the, the impacts of these particular programs. The good news is right now, everything is the way it's going to be right now up until at least July 3rd. So that is still a few more months. Um, as we all know, this time in this pandemic is, is crazy. Like we just don't know from one month to the next if it's going to go up or it's going to go down. So obviously, as we watch that, we'll also make recommendations as we get closer to those dates where we see those subsidy rates start to go down. If it looks like things are not better, we will be pushing strongly for them to maintain it at the current rate or even increase it if it's really bad, right? So those are definitely things that we do. I mean, even in our, I had a call this week with some folks from the finance, um, some senior finance officials about the budget after the budget. And that was one of my questions to them. Like, how are you as like the people making these decisions going to decide whether to prolong the wage and rent subsidy from September to November? Or do you have certain parameters in your mind that you're going to sort of look for in order to make that decision because they are going to, you know, put the flexibility into the legislation to allow them to do that without having to create a whole new piece of legislation. And their answer was no, we're just going to have to wait and see how things evolve. It's been so unpredictable, we just don't know. So that's, you know, essentially we're all this together and the way that we do it, it's based on your feedback. So if you tell us 
I'm not ready. I need this for another two, three, four months. That drives um, the messaging we will use. And as you saw in the budget, it can it can have an impact and can get changes made. And one of the things, just to support what you're saying, Corinne, about we we do that based on your feedback. It's you know we use the comments actually that you make to us in these webinars as well as our surveys. And our latest surveys are showing that 65% of you across Canada are saying that your business is still very dependent on and needs um, these subsidies in order to make it through the pandemic. So we make we regularly, depending on what part of the country you're in, those businesses in Toronto, Peel, actually most of Ontario, um, has um, are, are even higher on that than businesses in um, some of the Western provinces. We're also very um, much reflecting that. Uh, that feedback. Um, and then on the travel industry, Corinne, um, I just want to reassure, you know, we're getting so many comments on that. And, um, you know, we, you know, we continue to hear from members across the country who depend on tourism or, or travel in some way. And um, we're looking right now, and I, if you'll know on the last survey, there were some special questions um, for that sector. And so we're putting together something very targeted and specific on that, but we do hear you and we're, we understand um, how awful the situation um, is that you're, that you're in. And we're, you know, we're continuing to look at creative ways to, um, to fight what helps us obviously is your story so even when you're asking a question here letting us know I'm you know I employ normally employ five people and I'm you know like a little bit of detail because what politicians and the general public respond to in this is the story so saying 50% of businesses are you know are 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 terribly affected by this is much different by saying let me tell you the story of the business who's been you know family business Three generations, ten employees, you know, were expanding before the pandemic and now have had to, you know, mortgage the house. It's the story that sells. So to the extent that you can help us with that in your comments, um, it's really helpful in our advocacy work. Okay. Um, so um, one, one completely, Rachel might be um, on deck for this one actually is. Um, John is asking, are you aware, let's switch gears entirely, are you aware of businesses en masse being denied liability insurance um, if you proved PPE, and I'm not sure what proved PPE means there, Rachel, maybe you know, um, but John, yeah. John, that yeah, question. That, uh, yeah, I think he's trying to say that he's providing PPE. Um, ah, I see. Okay. Yeah, and and that uh, we have heard from very few members, though I should mention that um, insurance providers are, are putting limits to those who are creating PPE. Um, it, it is something that uh, I think it was John, if, if he can get in touch with me or I'll, I'll send him an email to follow up on his situation. It's something we're looking into for sure. Okay, great. Um, and Corinne, maybe an ag question for you. Is the support for mandatory quarantine just for agriculture or for all industries? We are in a summer camp and bring in temporary foreign workers. That's from Mark. I, we might have to, um, if we yeah, know. I might have to, do you know, Rachel? I think it might just be for agriculture, but... Um, so it's it's food uh, manufacturers as well as uh, farms, uh, yeah, agriculture and food fishermen related as well. types of industries only. Yeah. Food. So that might be something that we can. That might be something, Mark, that we can. You know, we can ask for that um, summer camp and bringing in temporary foreign workers. Here, I'm sure you're not alone in that, and I'm sure there are others that bring in temporary foreign workers. So I think asking that we extend that provision to others that might bring in temporary foreign workers would be a really good lobbying request. So thanks for the suggestion, Mark. Um, I actually uh, have a question for Corinne. I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer it, but I thought I would try. We're getting a lot of questions on the CHRP. Yep. I'm still getting used to that acronym. Um, but uh, Jim wants to know if uh, it will be accessible to non-arms length hires. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, from what I could read in the budget, again, we're still waiting lots of details, but it seemed to indicate that um, as long as they aren't um, 
as long as the, the they're not making like significantly more than in the baseline kind of thing. So I think that there is, uh, I think there is a provision that allows for that as long as it's you know along the lines of what everybody else is making kind of thing. So I believe so. But those are the details that we're still going to have to wait before we absolutely know for sure. <laughs> and good. Rachel, a couple of comments here. One from from Joe about. Um, uh, uh, have you tried to phone CRA lately? It takes forever if you can get through, and chances are you'll get a dusty answer. Which yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's up and down depending on the time of day that you call as well. I just want to throw that in there, um, and especially with this new um, news that I shared earlier today, um, I, I would not be surprised if, if you still have to wait three hours or, or longer. But please let us know how long you guys are waiting. This is always feedback that we. Um, love sharing but not really love sharing with uh with uh cra yeah that's um, great i uh, thought i would just mention one question that we had linda who wanted to know on any news for the ontario yeah. hospitality and tourism grant and so far no timelines have been provided and i'm hearing a lot of you um be uh, a little confused about the the other ontario uh, small business grant um, some people are, are, are getting words of, of potential pre-audits or, or whatnot. Um, they're, they're case by case and, and, and this program has been pretty slow to, to help people um, as well. So please let us know, give, us, give our BR counselors a call um, and we'll try our best to help you out. But the, the fastest um, response that you can do is, is reply to that email to, to get an update. Great. Um, Rachel, here's one for you, actually. Sorry, now that you've disappeared. Um, uh, and and Kurt, but Corinne, you can probably answer this too. Um, so Carol's asking, if you receive the Ontario Small Business Grant, are you able to apply for the SERS as well? So maybe just clarifying for people the lanes um, and federal and provincial support, because sometimes there's a little bit of, if you got one thing, you can't get another, but often there's not. So I don't know if either of you want to take that one. Yeah. I, yeah, more often than not, um, you are able to, in, in this particular case, they would be able to receive the SUS and the Ontario grant. Um, so I like to use the example of, of the Canada Summer Jobs Program. You can use the Canada Summer Jobs Program and the SUS at the same time. Um, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, one is federal, one's provincial. Yeah, and in this case, one is for rent and um, so yeah, you're, you're good there, Carol. That's some good news. Um, okay, um, Corinne, do you have questions? And you probably have a bunch on a theme because I know sometimes we get we get them in themes. So any ones that you want to put in? Um, well, I, I want to actually ask one of our PayWorks um, colleague. Uh, so Christine, if you're if you're there, I'd like you to come back up because um, Alia was asking that she's currently with WagePoint and wants to know if it's an easy transition to PayWorks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we walk you through that whole transition process. Um, we bring over all of your year to dates and everything like that for you so that it's streamlining your year end process. Um, but you would work directly with um, a member of our implementation team to walk you through that process and definitely hear from new clients. We survey them regularly to make sure that the experience transitioning over has been an extremely positive one. Um, so that is from the, the voice of the clients as well as myself. I was a payroll client before um, and transitioned over very seamlessly. Um, they just made the whole process very easy for us. Thanks, Christine. Um, so I, that's the only one that I had at the moment, but I think it's good to know that it's fairly easy to do if you are interested. So we encourage you to do that. Um, I do want to just also touch on Deb's question. She was saying, what are the chances that the budget doesn't get passed and triggers an election? And uh, of course, Deb, that's always a possibility because it is a minority government. Um, however, um, it's unlikely to happen around the budget only because uh, the NDP uh, has said that they will support the budget. So, um, and that's because they're not looking to go into an election quite yet. So all the Liberals actually need is one other opposition party to support them and they will be able to pass the budget. So we're not expecting it to fall, but you never know when it comes to minority governments. Um, but all indications are that this budget will pass and it's more likely if we are to have an election, it will be later in the year. I just wanted to touch on that one real quick. 
Gosh, lots of great details on the frustration with the CRA um, helpline. Uh, Carolyn saying um, three hours wait last Saturday. Frank is saying 3.4 hours to respond and get his mom EI, and they gave up after that happened four times. So um, these will be great examples, Corinne, I know for you as you're talking to CRA <laughs> for um, the frustrations. And yeah, it's uh, service isn't great right now. Um, also, lots of great examples, uh, Corinne, coming through, and thank you to all of you who are providing them on insurance renewals and Rachel. So clearly, that's a topic we'll um, be doing some more work on. And come back to um, people saying they can't even get insurance, and uh, so that's um, um, that's so tricky. A couple of people making comments about, you know, rather than more subsidies, we need to reopen. So Jorge and um, uh, Lisa was making a comment on telling, you know, the uh, Cottage Life magazine, telling people not to build this year, and a number along the theme of, look, we need to get reopened and not just subsidizing. Um, Corinne, do you I can comment on that, or do you want to comment on that? No, no, go ahead. You know, um, so it's interesting in our surveys, members have, do, like the general public, have a, a variety of views on this. And there are a lot of businesses who would like um, to see things reopen much faster. There are some of you who are, you know, who, who, are, who, are, who are a bit nervous about that. And so obviously there's one size fits all. But we are saying governments, our advocacy on this has really been focused on we need to, you know, safely reopen as quickly as possible. And so we've been advocating for things like, based on your survey results, um, better use of rapid testing. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of frustration about the sluggish vaccine rollout in Canada. And um, so we some comments um, on that, uh, but also looking at different comparisons. So, you know, we've been making, you know, we talk about in British Columbia, the hairdressers have been open and there are, it's not, there's no evidence that that's causing any serious risk to anyone. They've been shut down um, in uh, Ontario, particularly in Toronto and Peel. Um, so um, that's the kind of work we're doing on that. The comments around this are helpful and we, we agree we need to get, you know, we need transition off subsidies and back to sales as quickly as we safely can, but we do have a variety of different perspectives from members on, you know, on that, on that health piece of it, um, which is, which is obviously um, trickier. So I just thought I'd give a little context around that. Um, I guess we're getting close to time, uh, Corinne. Are there, there's a couple of other one, there's maybe one that I will put to you that's specific, but you can answer it quickly maybe. Um, the Self Storage Association um, is wondering if, you know, we've been working on that active passive tax issue for a while. I didn't see anything in the budget on that, but I, I was 724 pages, so I don't know if you did. And I think she's wondering if there was anything on that. No, no, there wasn't. Um, it continues to be an issue that uh, we do raise where we can. Uh, but nothing at this point on um, the active versus passive issue for folks that run self storage um, businesses. Great. I actually um, have a question that is from Hugo that says Is there a number we can reach Christine from PrayWorks to follow up on any questions or information? And as you well, um, I guess, Christine, yeah, maybe you can answer that question. We also have up there our own CFI member saving specialist. So that's uh, another group that can help patch you through. But Christine, maybe you um, have something else you'd like to add. Yeah, absolutely. If you if you follow that um, web page, the web link um, there, that'll take you through where you can fill out a form and request information back. Um, I don't know the best way to share information after. We can maybe provide you with our main number to call in through when you send out the recording of the video, if that would work. Great, and I'll keep you guys up here actually um, and for final comments. And um, if, um, uh, um, Rachel, if you wanna join us for that, that would be great. And Christine, I'm just looking at another couple of comments, one from Brian, never been happier with PayWorks. Um, so thank you again for, for, for joining us. Rachel, maybe I'll go to you for some final comments and then I'll go to you, Christine and Corinne, and I'll wrap it up. And so just any final thoughts for our, our participants? 
Yeah, I guess um, actually Michael Misho wants to double check if the 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 CS uh, the the Canada Summer Jobs and the SUS is not double dipping, but it, it's not because of the way that the programs are written and the the way that the Canada Summer Jobs is aligned with the SUS. So so just so you know, that's not double dipping. But uh, I guess as far as tips, make sure that you guys have the journal in hand. Make sure that you're talking to as many people that can help you, like like Christine, like like CFIB. Um, like your accountants or insolvency trustees, um, make sure that you're getting the best and the most information um, for you to make your best uh, business decision. Thanks, Rachel. And um, Christine, any last thoughts for, um, for, for folks as, as we uh, end the webinar? Just thank you for inviting us to participate today. Um, definitely welcome the opportunity to speak to any of the members um, to further explain how we can help your business through all of this. You know, you have a lot in front of you. There's a lot of great ways that Payworks can help you uh, just streamline things and make everything more efficient in addition to the cost savings as well. So I'm um, happy to help and thank you for having us here today. CFIB is a great partner for Payworks and definitely a very valued partner as well. So thank you. Well, thank you, Christine. Again, lots of great comments from members. I'm not surprised um, about that. And of course, doing something like switching your payroll provider is kind of a sometimes feel like a, a daunting task, but you guys make it easy and the cost savings make it put a smile on your face for sure. So um, thanks so much for that. And we'll encourage members to call you if they have any additional questions. Um, Corinne. Thank you. Um, so just thanks everybody for joining us yet again. Hopefully um, we gave you a bit of a taste of what was in the, a very large federal budget. Um, we will probably have a lot more information to share in the coming weeks as uh, some of these programs start to roll out. Your feedback will be valuable to us as we uh, move forward in trying to make sure that we're getting the best programs in front of uh, small businesses so that they can use them when they need them. So please continue to provide your feedback either through the webinars or through our helplines or um, through any other means, uh, certainly our email. Um, we're happy to hear from you and the surveys are a big one as well. So please fill those ones out. Uh, we do them monthly now and they've become critical to the work that we do um, in sort of presenting to government your, uh, your, your issues. So thanks again for joining us um, and hopefully we'll see you again or hear from you again soon. Thanks, Corinne. And I'll just uh, wrap us up by, um, you know, hang in there. Summer's coming and we will get through this. I know it keeps uh, that that uh, finish line keeps almost feeling a little further away and a little further away than we thought it would. But we will get through this. Um, and just to a uh, number of comments about, oh, that asking me a little bit more about needing examples. And it's just that extra when you're filling in our surveys or even your questions on these on these webinars, that little bit of extra detail about what kind of business you are or how it affects you not I don't you know you don't have to write a short story about it I know you're busy but that little extra detail just helps paint a picture for people and um, so when you're filling out the survey just if you um, think about that um, it's, it's just super super helpful to us when we're using examples you've seen us on the media using examples and talking about how this affects people uh, to make you feel a little bit more like real people to those people who are we're, we're trying to convince um, is very helpful um, but hang in there you guys are our heroes and we know it's been tough and particularly those of you in Toronto Peel urban centers uh, travel, arts and recreation, all of the sectors that have been extra hard hit by this. Um, you know, we're we're doing we're doing we're trying to do everything we can and hang in there. We know uh, for you it's been uh, we might all be in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat, and some of the boats are are uh, more challenging. Um, than others. And with that, we will end the webinar. Oh, one more thing. Let me know if um, if you want us to do region specific ones and we will um, make that happen. I tried to answer some questions um, on uh, for Alberta members on, on some things uh, through the webinar. But if, if you're looking for West Ontario Atlantic, we could certainly um, do the webinars that way. So let us know in the in the in the feedback. Um, and with that, we'll call it another webinar and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.